Hello everyone and welcome to the History of Byzantium. Episode 145, The Eastern Conquests. Today we need to take a tour of Byzantium's new eastern frontier. The changes here since 913 have been immense. Historian Mark Witto puts it like this. The lands from which the Arabs and their allies had launched annual raids during three centuries to ravage Anatolia were all under imperial rule. Tarsus, Melitene, Theodosiopolis, and Tifriki were each the seat of a Byzantine stratikos. Hamdanid Aleppo survived as a protectorate, the ruler of Damascus paid tribute, and on all sides Muslim and Armenian rulers waited nervously for the next advance. The contrast with 860 could scarcely be more dramatic or more complete. The 860s were the time when the Romans began their war with the Paulicians and slowly realised that caliphal armies were no longer going to return to Anatolia. Here we are a century later and the frontier has been turned inside out. Now it's the Byzantines who stand like birds of prey on the mountain peaks, looking down on Arab lands, choosing where to strike next. However, the situation is more complicated than a simple reversal of fortunes. Let's just remind ourselves of what has been taken, and then we'll get into more detail. Theodosiopolis was the northernmost conquest. It was not a wealthy city, but it functioned as the empire's main point of communication with the northern Armenian and Caucasian worlds. To the south, you have Melitene, and the cities clustered around the headwaters of the Euphrates River. These were more economically valuable. The plain of Melitene was fertile, and lots of good farmland was seized by the state. Melitene itself was also a trading post, bringing tax revenue into the empire, and the region was marginally safer now, thanks to the donation of Tehran. To the east of Melitene was the former Armenian kingdom of Tehran. This was willed to Nicephorus Phocas by the sons of Ashot III of Tehran. The princes gave up their titles in exchange for the security of positions in the Byzantine military. This was rugged territory, which became more pleasant as you approached Lake Van. Returning to Melitene and moving south, we come to the edge of the Taurus Mountains. The old jihad centres of Adata, Germanicaea and Samosata are all now in Roman hands. There's nothing special about them but strategically they controlled the passes into the mountains from the Syrian side. To the west of them you have Cilicia, which as a unit was probably the most economically valuable part of the eastern conquests. As you know, it's a pocket of Mediterranean farmland in a region dominated by mountain and plateau. It would take time, though, for Tarsus and the surrounding cities to regain their former prosperity. They had been severely ravaged during the past half-century. Finally, crossing the Amanus Mountains, we come to Antioch. Though the city maintained its Justinianic walls, the population inside was far smaller than it had been three centuries earlier. We're probably talking about fifty to 70,000 people. Still, this represented the largest city that the Romans had captured. The other border towns were much smaller, often just ten to 20,000 people. Further south, there were a series of forts and coastal cities, like Laodicea, which were under the empire's control, and Cyprus and Crete were, of course, also retaken, during this time. That list represents an impressive achievement, especially the speed at which the frontier was overturned once Nicephorus was in charge of the army. But let's put things in perspective. These are not rich possessions. Mountain settlements rarely are, 
because of their relative isolation. And many of the places taken had been depopulated during the change of ownership. The huge bonus for Byzantium was that there were no more raids on Anatolia. And of course, that was a blessing that paid a thousand dividends, psychologically as well as economically. But the territory gained did not transform the Roman state into a conquering machine. When Pompey marched through the same region a thousand years earlier, he nearly tripled the state's revenues and annihilated all opposition to further expansion. That was definitely not the case here. The Byzantines had taken control of their borderlands and established themselves as the dominant players in the region, but the change in their fortunes was less spectacular. As hinted at in that quote by Mark Witto, the local Arab and Armenian leaders now looked to Constantinople as master of their destiny rather than Baghdad. But projecting Roman power beyond the borderlands was going to be far harder than it might seem. We need a reality check. The conquests have been fun for anyone on Team Romania, but we need to understand conditions on the frontier to fully appreciate the strategic situation. For example, despite their superb performance over the past 50 years, the army are going to have a much harder time racking up victories during the next half century. The main reason for this is that they will be fighting on two fronts from now on. We saw this begin when John was on campaign in Bulgaria and he received the news that Antioch was under siege. To fight in Syria and the Balkans at the same time was a tough business. Even back in Justinian or Maurice's day, this was a scenario which caused huge problems and they possessed the revenues of Egypt to help finance two independent army groups. Our 10th century Byzantines do not enjoy that luxury. The eastern conquests were achieved thanks to the peace established with Bulgaria under Romanus Le Capinos. And in turn, Zimiskis' victory in Bulgaria was only possible because peace had come to the east. And that didn't last long. So from now on, the Roman army will be operating on two fronts, not always actively, but they can no longer afford to leave either end of their empire without a strong military presence. We'll talk more about Bulgaria in a future episode. Some listeners might be asking, why can't the new conquests help fund an expansion of the army? turn that tax revenue into soldiers, conquer more land, and then use that revenue to create more soldiers, and so on. Hopefully our brief tour of the new lands has begun to change your perspective. The majority of the new acquisitions would require years of tax relief before their farms could produce profitable yields, and they needed new farmers. Between those who'd fled or were killed during the invasions and the Muslims who chose to leave afterwards, the conquered lands were crying out for settlers. As we discussed in the narrative, Melitene, Tarsus and even Crete welcomed large numbers of Armenians looking for a new life. The authorities then turned to the Monophysite communities from the former caliphate to make up numbers. In the early days of the empire, the Romans were famous for planting colonies of loyal subjects or veteran soldiers in enemy territory. But Byzantium had far fewer people to spare. Greece, Thrace and Anatolia were not hugely populous areas. They were now enjoying growth, but the new Roman families being produced were simply filling the land which has lain empty during the centuries of Arab raiding. So despite expanding the empire, the Romans had not actually grown their resource base at the same rate. Governing non-Roman populations was another challenge. 
An example of this was the attempt to install the theme system in newly acquired Armenian land. A series of laws were issued by Nicephorus Focus, which indicate the problems being encountered. Uh, the big three being murder, desertion from military duty, and abandonment of the land. The army had recruited heavily from local Armenian populations during the campaigns in the mountains. After an area had been captured, a new Stratikos was appointed to govern it, and part of his remit was to find suitable plots of land to register as military holdings. This probably involved negotiations with the native inhabitants and the granting of land to Armenian infantrymen who'd been serving with the army. Murder, as a result of quarrels and criminal activity, are only to be expected in a newly settled area. But the need for legislation came when protecting thematic soldiers from losing their land. Uh, so clearly many of the murderers were Armenian soldiers and under Roman law, part of their land would be handed over to the victim's family. Nicephorus issued a specific law trying to protect the military plots while maintaining a just settlement. Similarly, desertion from military duty would normally be a severe offence that could lead to execution, but the need for manpower in the conquest armies and the desire to keep settlers on the new land was strong. Again, Nicephorus ordered for leniency to be shown if deserters turned up for duty again within a certain time period. And finally, abandonment of the land, always an issue during the centuries of Arab raids, was now becoming a problem in the newly acquired territories. Many Armenian soldiers had served in the army for cash, and never intended to settle in a Roman province. Others may have accepted the offer of land only to disappear when they received a better deal somewhere else. Normally, the government would wait 30 years before seizing abandoned land. It was understood that it might take a family a generation to bring certain fields back under cultivation. In the borderlands, Nicephorus reduced that waiting period to three years, a clear indication that finding settlers to work the land was a pressing concern. Those laws are illustrative of the Wild West nature of some of the Roman conquests, and therefore how long it would be before they could be relied upon to produce tax or troops for the empire. So, with that in mind, the expansion of the frontier takes on a slightly different feel. The Byzantine army now had to defend more territory, with roughly the same number of soldiers. And as we've just seen, you can't rely on mercenary troops to perform garrison duties. They come for the loot and the campaign pay. Once that's gone, they will go elsewhere. And remember that when Nicephorus was straining to hire more soldiers, the people turned against him. Some listeners expressed surprise at the lack of gratitude being shown towards Phocas, and they have a point. But at the same time, war was expensive, and the reaction of Zimiskis, once he was in charge, was to scale back on the annual campaigns. Though the Roman army was at this moment a powerful well-oiled machine, it had reached its maximum capacity under Nicephorus. From now on, wherever costs could be cut, they were. For example, the walls of Theodosiopolis and Melitene were not repaired after the Romans broke through them. In the case of Theodosiopolis, this is more understandable, as it was surrounded by Armenian allies of the empire. But Melitene was under threat from Sefadola for two decades after its fall. Presumably it had a strong garrison during that time, 
and once Saif was dead, there didn't seem any point in paying hundreds of masons and laborers to trek up into the mountains to fortify an isolated settlement. It wouldn't be until a century from where we are now, when Turkish raiders appeared, that the walls were patched up. This neglect of frontier fortresses was common all along the line. As you know, the Roman strategy had been to occupy every pass and peak in the hills surrounding their target cities. The garrisons they installed could then harass the enemy population in winter. But once those cities fell, the majority of forts were abandoned or handed over to the civilian authorities to use. It seems likely that very few professional garrisons remained along the north of the frontier. It made little financial sense to pay men to guard areas that were now at peace. In this context, perhaps you can better understand the princes of Tehran deciding to offer their kingdom to the Romans. The result was likely to be that few actual Byzantine troops would be stationed on their lands. Their lifestyle could continue as before. All they had to do was to provide soldiers for the occasional campaign and direct some tax revenue to the authorities. For them personally, this was more than compensated for by the salary they would now receive as Roman generals. More troops were stationed in the south, obviously. Uh, both the Hamdanids of Mosul and the Fatimids were actively engaged in operations against the Romans. But the recruitment drives of Nicephorus's time were over. The Tachmata was maintained with the additional unit which John had added, and where garrisons were needed, they were staffed with local theme troops or mercenaries. But clearly a conscious effort was made to take men off the payroll who were no longer needed. Maps showing the Byzantine revival seem to imply that the new lands are teeming with soldiers waiting for the next wave of conquests, but now you know better. Our own map is inevitably guilty of similar implications. I've updated it to attempt to demonstrate the new military and administrative arrangements. As I mentioned, during the conquests, each new patch of territory was given its own stratikos to manage the area. There were dozens of these new mini-themes running all the way from Theodosiopolis down to Antioch, and it would be far too confusing to try and replicate this on the map. So I've simply coloured the cities which are now under Roman control, leaving Arab and Armenian cities coloured black. Check it out on the website or social media, I've also embedded it with this episode, uh, so some of you may be able to see it now. As these new themes proliferated, Roman High Command began to refer to them as lesser themes, or in some circles, Armenian themes. Many of them were, of course, situated in Armenia, but even those further south often had either Armenian populations or Armenian garrisons. By the time Zimiskis was emperor, peace had come to most of these areas, and their local garrisons may have been withdrawn, along with their commander. When these fronts were again involved in warfare, a senior general, often given the title of dukes, was appointed to be in charge of the whole region, including any generals already serving there. In the north, the Dukes of Chaldea was in place, in the centre, the Dukes of Mesopotamia would control all the themes around Melitene down into the Taurus Mountains, and in the south was the Dukes of Antioch. I've reflected this on the map by making these three commands far bigger than any other, but you should remember that when these areas were at peace, it was likely that there was no overall commander, and that a local stratikos, or simply civil officials, were in charge. A part of why I can't be more specific about the military arrangements is that we don't have any sources describing them. Histories and documents that might have done may have been lost a century later during the Turkish invasions. It's very common in Byzantine history to have to extrapolate information from sources far removed from that time and place. 
The fact that we even know the names of various command positions comes to us not from any historical or military text, but from a seating plan for palace banquets. That small anecdote sums up so much about the job of Byzantine historians. I am constantly impressed by what they unravel from such thin strands. Having heard that, perhaps you'll understand why I don't plan on talking extensively about who now lived in the new territories. Several listeners asked for an ethnic and religious breakdown. Let's see if we can find more sources on that when we get to 1025. For now, you know that Muslims were ejected from the mountains, uh, but they were tolerated in Syria, so Antioch, Laodicea, and the countryside the Romans now controlled. Meanwhile, to the north, Armenians were the largest group migrating into the new territories, followed by Monophysites and then Orthodox Romans. Clearly, the government felt that even diverse Christian communities could live peacefully side by side, whereas they didn't want to deal with the potential strife and fifth columnists in a Muslim population. Though ideology probably played a part in this, the fact that Muslims were tolerated in Syria suggests it was also a practical decision. Once cities like Melitene and Theodosiopolis had been re-Christianized, they could then be demilitarized. Whereas to try and manage a truly mixed city would have required a full garrison to keep the peace. 4,000 troops were permanently stationed in Antioch anyway, so it was easier to handle that city's multicultural mix. Having just been besieged by the Fatimids, it's clear that Antioch was the front of the front line of the Eastern Conquests. And this is no surprise, it's situated in Syria, in Arab territory. It was the only city on the frontier with a permanent garrison of that size, and those soldiers were from the Tahmata, serving terms before being rotated out. Antioch was the shield for the whole southern Roman position, and hence why the treaty with Aleppo was so important. Aleppo was now a buffer state, giving early warning of attacks coming from the south. And what made Antioch different from all the other conquests was that it was the only one which was not defended by the mountains. Behind it, Cilicia had the Amanus range, beyond it, the Taurus Mountains, beyond them, Armenia. So long as the Romans garrisoned the passes, all the cities in the hills were considered relatively safe. That's all for today. As you can see, the major benefit to Byzantium from the conquests is the peace that has come to Anatolia. When we get to 1025, I'll talk more about how this manifested itself, but for now it's important to realize that the borderlands are not great sources of men or resources on their own. They were, though, gateways into the Armenian and Caucasian worlds beyond, and you may remember that on Zimiskiz's last campaign he borrowed 10,000 troops from the king of Armenia. If the Romans were planning on expanding their realm further, they would need recruits to come from this direction. But were they thinking of more conquests? Today we've discussed the what, how, and who of the Eastern Territories. Next time, we ask why. Were these acquisitions the plan all along, or did the Romans have wider ambitions? We'll discuss this from several angles and pose the question to Professor Cold Ellis. <laughs> <laughs>